we have the license to take risk, the expectation of failure. We have no quarterly earnings targets to promise to shareholders and we can hugely outperform and that's a good thing. Jeremy from Attest, thank you so much for coming in. We're going to chat today about something that probably not enough people do, right? Founders that have gone through funding rounds, founders that are, have lasted after the dreaded year, right? Uh, and beat the, beat the odds. To, to actually explain some of the mistakes they've made. So other founders that are watching the show, there's 40,000 of them plus watching this show, that are about to go through that journey, or, uh -huh. or right in the middle of that journey, or maybe have gone through it and like hearing about other people. Yeah. Before we get kicked off to create some context, a test, what is it all about? What does it do just to create some content? Um, so a test is a four-year-old company. We've raised a total of 20 million in three rounds over the last three and a half years. Um, we're today over 60 people. We're based in London. Uh, it's a SaaS platform. It helps B2C businesses take the guesswork out of growth. Um, it's software that connects you to the customers that you can't naturally reach, but the ones that you need to know to understand them in every moment, every decision in totally new ways to unlock growth starting in 90 seconds. Um, but I'm not here really to talk about a test. I'm yeah. here to talk about the mistakes I made, the things that people helped me learn at the beginning, yeah. still ring in my head every yeah. day. Um, and I got a lot of help. Uh, and you I always think- You're a first time founder. Yeah. You're a uh, first time founder. Uh, I got a lot of help from a lot of people, mostly really good advice. Some like, if bad defines good, I got some really good advice yeah. in a different way yeah, yeah, a few yeah, times. Uh, and always keen to share. Yeah. So, yeah. so the thing that, that caught my attention was the, the, the 60 plus employees, right? Yeah. A first time founder leading a business with 60 plus employees. What mistakes did you make along the way? Because it's had a lot of employees. It's true. A lot of heads to feed. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, like, we ended this year, I think, with 25. We raised a big round from a California-based VC in March, and now we're over 60. And like, a lot of that has happened in the last six to 12 months is when mm. we've seen our biggest growth happen, which is nice. Um, I think a big mistake, I've got three mistakes uh, in particular. I've made loads more, but there's three in particular <laughs> three I think biggies. are interesting um, <laughs> that I feel <laughs> still really bad about. Mm. Um, I think the first one is about hiring people from specific brands or specific backgrounds, okay. hiring a brand, not a person. Ah. And I see other founders make the mis this mistake all the time. Uh, I hear people come up to me and say, just hired XYZ from this company, or I've yeah. got this amazing person from Google or Apple or Facebook mm. or uh, some big media agency. And those people can be great, yeah. but at the same time, Somehow in founder world, we don't apply the same pressure to those people mm. and the same standards around uh, cultural fit, authenticity, the capability match. And I always like to try to hire people for their attitudes and their potential and like give them a huge amount of trust and get out of the way. Yeah. And when you hire someone from a big four accounting firm, it's easy to believe that they're going to be great. Of course. And often to forget to bother to test that they really are. Mm. And a mistake that I made several times was to hire someone based on where they came from with an assumption they would be great that I then completely failed to really validate and test. That's uh, so always great people who could do great things, but could they do great things with us? And were they right for mm. us at that stage? That's um, interesting. Yeah. We do hear that so much. Obviously we talk to founders daily, it's what we do. Uh, it's what we do all the time. And you do say, I just hired, you know, just hired someone from Uber. Yeah. And that seems to be enough. No. You know, there's, there's, there's not, you know, um, they don't say, I just hired someone from Uber who helped Uber do this and this, which means it can help us do this and this and culturally. If it, no, it's like, I just hired someone from Uber. Yeah. And that seems to be, you know, this, the golden standard or Google or, you know, I just hired someone from Revolut now, even in newer companies, um, but they could have been the worst employees in that company. <laughs> you know, like. So it's important to find out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, and I think sometimes I'm that person as well. So one of our seed investors, um, I'm, I had a lot, spent a lot of years at McKinsey, mm. uh, which is a big strategy consulting firm. And they, one of our seed investors said to me, nine out of 10 McKinsey founders are complete bullshit, exclusive language. Yeah. Um, how do I know you're the one in 10? And I basically told him to go stuff it. Um, and yeah. he said, well, that answer my question. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. like, it's kind of show, not tell. Like, yeah, 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 of course. Um, and I'm that person sometimes and I feel it, but it's just an interesting thing that I see time and time again, hiring the experience without looking for what the person is really trying to do and whether it's a match right now. Um, hopefully a mistake I'll never make again, but I've seen so many people, including me, do it. 
Super interesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there for a second because okay. I never started this. Oh no! So we'll do like seven, maybe seven on top of that. So okay. It probably feels about right. I need to remember what my second point yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. It's my it's my kryptonite. The next one. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that's really interesting, right? And and to be completely honest, it's not something that I ever put two and two together with because big brands they can kind of blur you. You know, it can kind of blur the, the vision a little bit. What other mistake did you make? Um, Another one that's really personal to me, it's kind of my kryptonite, is assuming that people will always ask what they need to know. Okay. Um, I try to create a really inclusive culture where there's a huge amount of trust, almost too much trust, where we delete the risk of failure and therefore really empower people to grow in the ways that they want to and that making mistakes is fine. Mm. Um, in my background where I used to work, there was a concept called obligation to dissent, which means that when you have a point to make or you have a question to ask or you think something isn't going the right way, it is your obligation and your duty to do something about it. And for some reason, I still carry that with me and I assume that everyone in the world is constantly abiding by this rule yeah. because it's a habit for me. I made the mistake of assuming that everyone worked this way. So when I'd ask for feedback and there wasn't any, I would assume that's because there is none. Uh, when I asked for ideas and I got loads of great ideas and then some of them were all in this one group and some of them were here and that we went with this one, not this one, I assumed that these people weren't offended unless they said so. Turns out in the outside <laughs> world, there's so many different types of people who want to work in so many different ways. And a huge mistake that I made in the early days is assuming that the team that I was building was somehow representative of the way that uh, I was trained to work and that these questions and ideas would come out naturally. Mm. And the mistake I made was um, A, sort of waiting for questions rather than actively inviting them. I tried to create an uh, environment where every question is okay and then hope that they came. When instead what I've learned to do now is ask in so many different ways, offer so many different opportunities for people to give feedback, ask the questions mm. in groups, individually, in text, in Slack, by email, in an anonymous suggestion box. All of these things are different routes and everyone yeah. has their own little spectrum of preferences and we need to cater to all of them. The way mm. you get maximum yield out of your team and maximum input and maximum feedback is by catering to all preferences and that means that all the doors are open each in a unique and special way. And that's worked really well for us. I'm still don't think we're at 100%. Yeah. I don't think that's achievable. But at the same time, just asking in many different ways and offering many different channels and constantly reminding this is possible has helped us as a company get a lot better. Uh, but it's my biggest Achilles heel. Really? Yeah. It's an interesting one because 60 odd employees, a lot of people won't email the CEO and say, you didn't, I felt my idea was better, you didn't give me a good reason why you didn't go with it, I'm not all that happy. Yep. They don't want to create conflict. But is it scalable for you as a founder to go individually to people and say, were you okay with that decision? Or maybe, that's, maybe that is the role of you as a founder, is to, is to be that, is to be that uh, person. Yeah, I try to keep a little clock in my head about when was the last time I really spoke with someone, even in the lift, even at coffee, even at like team drinks or over lunch, in a client meeting, on the walk to an investor meeting. When was the last time I really spoke with someone, even mm. for a short period of time? And I look for the outliers, the ones who, for whatever reason, I structurally fail to engage with and I try to find a new method to approach those. That's how I try to open more and more doors and mm. more and more methods of getting more and more input. And it tries, what I'm trying to do is make us a more inclusive company and also for me to learn more from them. Um, our model, we try to, like, I see my role is to serve the team rather than, like, run the team. Yeah. And offering those people and trying to find different ways of engaging them is, for me, a constant fascination. So, so you're more... As a, as a leader, you're more of a, you know, I can, you know, I'm the person to help you, you know, with your day to day. If you need help, come to me. If you're upset, come. And you, vice versa, you can go to them. Yeah. Did you hire a person in uh, as a manager to be the person who would go up and say, you didn't do this right? So you're the, the good guy in a way? In oh, thing? yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't really have a bad guy um, or a bad person. We, so our model is to try to, we have a concept called responsible autonomy. Uh, and we also, one of our values is also 100% trust from day zero. You don't need to earn trust, you start with it. Mm. It's yours to build upon rather than yours to build. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to hire really smart people who know a completely new way of cracking the problem we're trying to crack, and we're trying to learn from them. So my method is to try to hire those people, excite them about the mission, but without giving them 
really specific ways about how they're going to do the thing that we hired them okay. to do, create a huge vacuum above them, delete the risk of failure underneath them, and then say, how can I help? Uh, and that often leads to really good results. Mm. Sometimes apocalyptic failures. Uh, yeah. But as I said earlier, like a failure rate above zero but below 50 is a good thing. Mm. Um, we aim for 25% failure rate in everything we do. And that's what we're trying to do. So we don't really need that kind of performance or accountability mindset. Mm. We try to come at it from people who are trying to crack the problem and can teach others and then just to let them do that. How do you as a leader know who will fit culturally? That's, that's such, like going through a growth stage, you, you start as a founder with, and then a person comes on board, maybe it's a co-founder that you get on board and maybe it's a, you know, a CTO and maybe it's a COO and then it builds out and you get a team and then it's, you know, six or seven people, yeah. you know, let's all go for beers, yeah. you know, let's, you know, let's go like golf on a Saturday, let's go, let's do this and that and yeah. let's all get for lunch together, brilliant, and it's all like this and then it starts to grow and grow and then pockets appear of people who, who aren't all in the one group, how can you ensure, and it comes up time and time again, about that company culture? Uh, we do three things. Okay. Um, one of them isn't new. So one of them is we do a lot of fit interviewing. Uh, in our interview process, we have a t usually two or three stage process. Okay. And the cultural fit one is at the start. Right. Uh, and you, we don't get into any technical stuff until you've passed the cultural fit test, which is something that we're still trying to figure out how to do that well. There's so many different it's models and it's not new. Mm. Uh, the second thing we do is throughout the interview process, we kind of create these casual opportunities. Like if you're in for an interview, why not stay for lunch? Uh, if you're, while you're here, why not meet this person who won't be working with you every day, but you'll definitely be working together. And we get little kind of interpersonal reads yeah. from that. Not uh, in the context of the interview, but just the, the human interaction. More casual. Exactly. Uh, I think psychologists call it limbic resonance. How did you feel about this person? The way they approached you, the question they asked, were they really thinking about themselves here? Do they feel like someone who represents the values? And we get these little tiny partial reads when you add them mm. up, and it's actually a very powerful thing. It's a set. And we bring all those people into the final decision process, the interviewers and then everything that's informal as well wow. when it happens, which is quite nice. Particularly with developers, we take them out for lunch or for drinks, or we bring them to an event, something like that. Just a great way to make sure that cultural fit is really there, or at least there's the chance for it to be there. Because you mm. can't always say binary yes or no. The third one, which I think is quite unusual is we really try to scare people off uh, okay. which, which, which means that the people we're left with are definitely right okay. uh, so there's an example recently where we were hiring I shouldn't name this person yeah. <laughs> but we were hiring a person just when we were closing our 16 million dollars round with uh, our California investors yeah. um, this person was joining us in a senior role and uh, but it was while we were completing the round we'd signed the term sheet we were doing all the stuff in the middle I basically said look, if rounds collapse, you know this, you've been through this process many times before, rounds can collapse mm -hmm. um, for unknown reasons at any given time. You should know that the first person that we'd be saying we don't need anymore is this extremely expensive role. Uh, and you should know that unfortunately you'd be the first one out the door. Mm. And like, if whatever happens, happens, you're the first one to go. And she was like, yep, that's completely fine. That's completely expected. That's exactly why I'm here. Where do I sign? I'm like, really? that's why you. Ah. Yeah. She completely got the situation. She found this not even scary. She found it exciting. Um, and she was like, great, yeah. And I'm trying to join before the next valuation event. I'm like, boom. Uh, little, it's not a cultural thing, but mm. it is a interpersonal thing. It's a feel thing. It's a fit yeah. thing. Because uh, if someone has, you know, the guts to go, I realize the risk, yeah. but I believe in it so much that I'm willing to take it. Yeah, and it, even better is if they've known it all along and, that, and they're still there, they're like, yeah, obviously. We're like, boom, that's the right person. And we do that with uh, product design, engineering, salespeople. Uh, we literally try to say, these are, the, these are the things you're stepping into. These are the things we haven't figured out yet. This is what could go wrong. We have this much runway. This company might not exist in 12 months. We have this much, we are dependent on these outside factors. These are the things that we're working on product wise that might go right or wrong. These are the bets that we've made. You should know these things and knowingly um, jump straight in head first in the deep end or probably not right. Are you excited about more mistakes as a leader? Yeah. I always say if you're not crashing the Formula One car, you don't know how fast it can go. Hence the 25% mm. failure rate. Yeah. 0% failure, you're not trying enough stuff. 50% mm. failure, you're starting, you're probably trying the wrong things too often. 
exactly in the middle is exactly 25. I'd say we're in a 15 to 35 range. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think mistakes are good. The, the risk or well, the joy that we have as tech companies and the advantage we have over big incumbents uh, who we're trying to disrupt is we have the license to take risk, the expectation of failure. We have no quarterly earnings targets to promise to shareholders mm -hmm. and we can hugely outperform and that's a good thing. In many big companies, hugely beating your performance targets is often a bad thing. Yeah, as if you didn't forecast properly. Yeah, oh, wow, and yeah. any execution mistakes are terrible because you wasted resources. We have resources, we should take risk. That's mm. our mandate. The LPs behind our investors, behind the funds, behind the term sheet, behind the cash, they want that risk too. Of course. That's their risk profile. So I don't think we're doing our job unless we're taking that risk. It's our responsibility. Of course, well look, when you're sitting in the office and you think I've made enough risks and I've made enough mistakes to go back on the startup farm, we'd love to have you. So okay. thank you, thank you so much, Jeremy. <laughs> thank you Appreciate so much. It's been a pleasure to chat.